lesson 1.5.8. The objectives of this lesson are to identify domain and range, to know different ways to represent a, a relation, and to be able to identify relations that are also functions. And this is going to be important as we move forward because we will be looking at linear equations graphically. We'll um, be representing scenarios using equations. So it's important to understand what a function is versus what it is not, as well as to be able to recognize the domain and the range within our functions. So let's take some notes, get out a piece of paper and a pencil, and write down domain. Domain always represents the x values. Another name that we sometimes use is inputs and also independent variable. So if you look down at this graph, the x-axis right here, I'll draw you an arrow, represents the domain. So all the x values in your graph represents the domain. Okay, if we compare that to the range, the range is your y values. Another name is the outputs or the dependent variable. So right here, that axis contains your range, your y values. Okay, the reason we say that the range is a dependent variable and the domain is the independent variable is because typically the domain is not something we control. The x values usually represent time or something like that and we don't typically control that, but those x values, those time values influence the range or the y values Depending upon how long we run, we end up going further. So domain is typically your input, what you put in in order to find your output, what you are getting out. Now if we look at the um, dots on this graph, we can actually pull the domain and the range from those. The first thing that we would want to do is to record though the coordinate points of each of these dots. So if you remember, this dot down here we go over on the x-axis 6 and we go down on the y-axis negative 1. We can look at this dot and say that we go over 4 and we go up looks like 2. Do the same thing for the next 3, 5 and the final one looks like 1 comma 5. Okay, so make sure that you are competent pulling out the points, the coordinates for each of these points. And then remember that the first number represents the x and the second number represents the y. So if we were going to list our domain, key thing to keep in mind is that you only list each number once, even if you have two of the same numbers, and you list them in numerical order. So if I was going to write the domain, I would look at all my x values. I have a 1, a 3, a 4, and a 6. So I would write each of those 1, 3, 4, and 6. Notice that those are all in numerical order and I've only listed each number once. Granted, I only have one of each, but if I did have two ones, say for example, I would list one only once. If I had two threes or three threes or four threes, I would list only one three. Okay, now let's look at our range. So our range consists of the y values. In this case, the smallest y value we have is a negative one, followed by a two. And then notice that we actually do have two fives, but I won't list two fives, I will just list one. Okay, and that is how you list your domain and your range. Let's look at a few more examples and state the domain and range for each. So in our first example, we have a list of coordinate points. And if we state the domain for each of those points, we would do it just as we had before. So in numerical order, listing only one number from each. Okay, so our domain. We have a two, a four, a three, a six, and a two. Two twos, but we only list the two once. That's our lowest number, followed by a three. 
and then a four, and finally a six. That is our domain. So I've got everything listed, the two, the four, the three, the six, and the other two is already represented. Okay, so if we do the range, we do it the same way. I have a negative three, a six, negative one, another six, and a three. So I'm gonna go in numerical order. My negative three would come first, followed by the negative one. So it's smallest to greatest is numerical order. And then we have a three, and finally we have the six. And that would be considered my range. Another way that you can see points represented is in a table like this. Um, and it's pretty easy to pull off the domain and range here because X, these, this is your domain. Y, this is your domain. I mean your range, sorry. So your X, let's change our color, represents the domain, as we already said. And our Y represents the range. So it's nicely organized for us already. We can still list it as we did before, we would go from smallest to greatest. So negative two, negative one, zero, one, two for our domain. And then our range, again, we do the smallest to greatest. So we start with the three, then the four, five, six, and finally the seven. Okay. Another example is graphically, just as we did in the, in the um, last slide. This is a graph of all the points. And the easiest thing to do is to list the points and then pull them off. But what I'm going to do is just look at the graph this time and pull the points off because I know that my domain are my X points. So I can see pretty clearly how that goes. I have a 1, I have a 2, I have a 3, a 4, a five and a six. So I can go one, two, three, four, five, and finally six. And I can do the same thing with the range. Just going to look at my graph. So remember that the range is your y values. So as I'm traveling up, I have no negative y values. As I get up here, it looks like I have a one, a two. I have two fours, but I'm not going to list both fours, remember? And then I have a five, and then I have a six. So I have every number from one to six, and I will only list my fours once. All right. And that's how you write and state the domain and range. And there's a, a couple of, or three different ways that you might see points represented. Okay, now let's look at different ways to represent a relation. And that's very similar to what we've already seen. We can represent them, number one, as ordered pairs. And we've already seen that. A relation is just a relationship between X and between Y. So if there's an X value, then there's a relation between X and Y. So we can have ordered pairs like two and one, or negative six and zero. Those are all relations. Okay, we can also see relations in a table. We've seen that already. So we can list the number two here, the number one here, just like this, the number negative six and zero. Two and one form a relation, negative six and zero form a relation. We can also see those in a graph, graphically. So if you have a graph, and we plot our points on the graph. Two, say that's a two here, and a one is right here. And negative six will come all the way out here, and zero would be right here. So there's our two points represented graphically. Again, this is a relation, and this point is a relation. We can also see a mapping diagram, and we won't see this as frequent, is the others. However, it might look something like this. And we would list our x's, we would list our y's, and we typically list them in order again. So negative 6 and then 2 
And then we list our y's in order. So we would list the 0 first and then the 1. Now these just happen to map directly across from each other. The way you show the mapping diagram, the relationships, is you draw a line between the relationships. Okay. Um, but what if I give you some different points? Let's say I give you negative 3 and 7, and I give you 2, negative 4, and finally about 0, 3. All right, so let's look at that one. So if we were to write that out in our table, in our mapping table, I would list my x's, like I said, from smallest to greatest. So 3, 0, 2. And granted, this is not your typical t table. This is a mapping diagram. Okay, and then I would list my y values, also in order, from smallest to greatest. So notice that I'm not necessarily listing key points together because this is a mapping diagram. But now I will map the points. So I have a negative 3 and a 7. Well, this negative 3 goes with the 7. 2 and negative 4 go together, and then 0 and 3 go together. And you'll see in a minute how the mapping diagram is helpful when you're trying to determine if a relation is actually a function. Okay, so four different ways to represent a relation. Now let's actually take it a step further and identify whether or not the relation is a function. Okay, so again, you might want to write this down. A function is a relation where each input has exactly one output. Very important here, it has only one output. Okay, each input has one output. So if we look at some examples, I have four here, we're going to determine if these are in fact functions. We know they're relations because anytime you have a relationship between x and y, it's called a relation, but it's not necessarily a function. Okay, so if we look at our first example and we follow the directions, a relation where each input has exactly one output, well, negative 3 is our input, that's our x value, and it only goes to the 2. Negative 1 only goes to the 3, 2 only goes to the negative 4, and 4 only goes to the negative 4. This may be a little bit confusing because two inputs, two different inputs, go to the same output, but that doesn't violate our definition that says each input has to have exactly one output. So the key is to look at your x values, your input. And each of these x values only has one line drawn from it. So yes, this one is definitely a function. Okay, so compare that to the second example. Well, negative 2 only goes to a negative 4. However, we have a problem here. Our negative 1 has two outputs, right? Negative 1 is mapped to negative 1 and negative 1 is also mapped to 2. So in this case, this input has two outputs. So right now I can say that it is not a function. So this is a no. You may also see it as ordered pairs. So the way to do that is to look at our inputs. So we have a 3, and it goes to the 1. 5 is a different input, goes to a 2. Uh-oh, we have another 3. So we have a 3 that has two different outputs. We have a 3 that has an output of 1, and we have a 3 that has an output of 4. So this is not a function. So the answer here is no. We have two outputs for one input. Now let's look at the bottom example. We have a 2, a 5, a 3, and a 0. Since I only see one of each input, then I know that it cannot have two outputs. So this is definitely a function. Okay, our final way to illustrate functions is graphically. And we have a trick that we can use to determine if in fact a relation is a function, and it's called the vertical line test. And what this test says is that if a vertical line drawn anywhere on a graph hits the graph only once, then the graph is indeed a function. So what does that mean? That means I can take and draw a vertical line anywhere. So let's get my line tool and let's draw a vertical line on this circle. So I'm just going to draw it anywhere. And if you'll notice, that vertical line does in fact hit the graph in more than one place. The vertical line hits the graph here, and by graph I'm referring to the line or the circle that is 
the function that is graphed and it hits it here. So on this first example, no, a circle is not a function. You can graph a circle, but it is not a function. Okay, so let's look at the second example. In this example, we have a parabola that is upside down. I can pick and I can draw a line somewhere if I want. And, oops, I drew it a little off the page. It's hard to see, let's draw it a little closer. How about right here? And I noticed that it only hits it in one place. I could draw it anywhere and it would still only hit the graph in one place, right there. So this is going to be yes, this is in fact a function. Okay, how about the second one? Maybe by now you can see whether or not this is a function. If I take my line and I draw it, anywhere that I draw it, I am actually going to be hitting this graph in more than one place, up here and here, which means it violates the vertical line test, so no, that graph is not a function. Okay, finally a graph you're familiar with, a linear equation, this is a line, right? Are lines functions? Let's check. So if I draw a line, potentially draw a line, let's get the line tool, and I draw a line anywhere on the graph, let's go up here, how about? If you notice, no matter where I draw the line, it truly is just going to hit the graph in one location. So all of our lines are in fact functions. Okay, and this concludes our lesson on identifying functions and domain and range.